Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, good morning. All right. Hi. But good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Jeff Coben. It's my privilege to serve as Dean of the School of Public Health. Uh, it's also my privilege to welcome those of you here today for our colloquium. I also want to welcome those uh, who may be participating online uh, via our streaming webcast, uh, including uh, the many members of the West Virginia Association of Local Health Departments, who I know are gathered today uh, in Flatwoods for, uh, for their monthly meeting. As you're all aware, West Virginia is at the epicenter of a national crisis that's been called a public health emergency. No matter what we call this problem, the public health and economic toll that opioid misuse and its related complications is having upon our citizens, their communities, our state and our nation cannot be overstated. This crisis demands our attention, our focus, and our action. It was just a little less than a year ago that the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources submitted a formal opioid response plan to the governor and the West Virginia legislature. That plan, which was the result of an intensive effort, including local and national experts and significant public input, included a list of 12 high priority recommendations for immediate action and implementation in West Virginia to help address the opioid problem. These 12 priority recommendations cut across the spectrum from prevention to early intervention, treatment, overdose reversal, supporting families with substance use disorders, and promoting recovery. One of the priority recommendations was that West Virginia should strengthen its support of harm reduction policies and programs. Having been personally a member of that panel, I can tell you that we were provided with very compelling evidence on the effectiveness of harm reduction programs, their importance as a strategy to help curb the epidemic, and the need to expand these efforts across the state. Yet, over the last year, we have seen both here in West Virginia and elsewhere that there are challenges with implementing harm reduction programs in local communities. In some cases, these challenges have led to a lack of community support and actual discontinuation of programs. So this is the context for our discussion today. On the one hand, we have had strong recommendations for expanding harm reduction programs across the state, while on the other hand, we've had ex we have experienced some significant challenges with implementing these programs in local communities. Today's event will take a closer look at harm reduction and syringe services programs, and our intent is to provide a forum for sharing multiple perspectives about such programs, including the perspectives of public health, law enforcement, and local communities. I'm honored to introduce today's speakers, who I believe will help us better understand these different perspectives and help us find pathways for moving forward together. Our first presenter is Dr. Holly Hagen, who is an epidemiologist and professor at New York University College of Global Public Health and the co-director of the Center for Drug Use and HIV-HCV Research at NYU. 
Dr. Hagen also serves as the chair of the executive steering committee of the Rural Opioid Initiative, a collaborative project of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institutes of Health, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and the Appalachian Regional Commission. This initiative funds nine research projects in areas with some of the highest rates of overdose and hepatitis C infection, including an ongoing project here in West Virginia uh, that many of you are aware of. Our second presenter is Donnie Vernell. Deputy Sheriff Vernell is an investigator with the Dane County, North Carolina Sheriff's Office and former special agent in charge for the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations Drug Diversion Unit. He serves on several state level committees combating prescription and opioid drug abuse. He also serves as a law enforcement consultant on special projects with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition where he has been heavily involved in the naloxone, the naloxone program for law enforcement and first responders. Deputy Sheriff Arnell will be providing us with a law enforcement perspective on harm reduction programs, while Dr. Hagen will be providing us with an overview of the scientific evidence and data regarding the safety and effectiveness of harm reduction strategies, including syringe services programs. And our final presenter will be Dr. William Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey is Associate Vice President for Coordination and Logistics and the Chief Collaboration Officer for the West Virginia University Health Sciences Center. Bill is an emergency medicine physician by training and has over 30 years experience as a healthcare provider, researcher, and policy leader, particularly in the area of unique and innovative methods and systems for providing quality and cost-effective medical care. As part of the Health Sciences Center leadership team, Dr. Ramsey is directly involved in the operation and management of specific healthcare and wellness improvement initiatives and serves as a li liaison for a variety of entities, including the government, community organizations, and other health stakeholders throughout West Virginia. Dr. Ramsey recently helped to lead a unique community engagement effort we, which is affectionately known as the Where's Waldo Project. And uh, the intent was to identify issues and concerns among stakeholders across the state regarding substance use disorder, including harm reduction. And he'll share some of those insights with us uh, in his presentation today. We're gonna ask each speaker um, to deliver their presentation sequentially and I would like to ask that we hold our questions until the end uh, of all three presentations. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion at that time. I promise you we'll, we will have sufficient time for questions and answers. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions um, and uh, we will have uh, a, a great opportunity for dialogue. Uh, at any time, if you have a question during any of the presentations that you're thinking of, uh, you can also submit those online uh, via Slido uh, by going to slido.com, entering code P145, and simply typing your question in. We will be, collect, we will be collecting those and uh, uh, presenting those questions if time allows. <coughs> so, without any uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holly Hagen. Please join me in welcoming her. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, and I want to thank Dr. Coben for the invitation and for the people that organized this event today. And um, I'm, I'm ready to get started on uh, summarizing the research around safety and effectiveness of harm reduction programs. So um, let's start with a little summary of the principles of harm reduction. Uh, harm reduction acknowledges that drug use is part of our human history. We've been using drugs since we first stood up on our hind legs, and um, so it's bound to be with us for um, a long, long time. Um, the point of harm reduction is to minimize it, its harmful effects. 
It acknowledges too that there are safe ways of using, using drugs and also that the criteria for judging the success of harm reduction programs is not the achievement of abstinence and the focus is more on programs that will improve the quality of individual and community life and well-being. Um, harm reduction services should be provided in a non-judgmental and non-coercive uh, manner and um, this is really essential. This is really a, an essential element um, that is important to their success. It's also recognized that having people who use drugs involved in the creating, creation of policies and programs surrounding harm reduction um, contributes to their success and their effectiveness. And we must also stop and, and recognize that poverty, class, racism, past trauma, and other social inequalities, these affect both people's vulnerability to drug-related harm and also their um, capacity for dealing with harm effectively. Um, and also finally, and this is very important, harm reduction does not minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger associated with illicit and illicit drug use. So I'm, today I'm going to summarize the evidence, research evidence on the safety and effectiveness of medication assisted treatment, syringe service programs, and overdose prevention um, uh, strategies. And I want to just say right now that I want, I'm going to make these slides available. There's a, there's a lot of citations here, so I want anyone in the audience and anyone who's listening to have access to these, to these, uh, to these slides so that you can use it to, to further your own work. So the major harms that are acknowledged that are caused by, by substance use include, of course, fatal and non-fatal overdose, um, bacterial and viral infections, and social harms. And so the major strategies used in harm reduction include syringe service programs, safe drug use, education, that's really a core of most, most harm reduction programs, medication-assisted treatment, the provision of, of clinical services, for, including screening for, um, for other conditions and infections, providing, in some cases, care on site, and um, in almost all cases, uh, referrals to any other uh, needed services, Overdose and prevention is, of course, included in that, and social support service to help, again, people uh, deal with um, any social and uh, mental health barriers that they may have to uh, grappling with, um, with their substance use and its consequences. So let's start with medication-assisted treatment. So there is, you know, both methadone and buprenorphine have been studied for decades. Buprenorphine is, is relatively new, but we have a, we, I can say that we have extensive compelling evidence for both their evidence, for both their safety and um, uh, uh, eff effectiveness in treating uh, opioid use disorders. These drugs are both opioid agonists, so they do activate opioid receptors. And in the case of methadone, they replace opioids fully. In the case of buprenorphine, it's a partial uh, replacement for um, opioids at those recept at receptors. There's a lot of evidence showing that um, they both reduce opioid use and um, injection use of those drugs. There's also substantial evidence showing that they reduce bacterial and viral infections. There's been two uh, very, uh, very recent Cochrane collaboration systematic reviews and meta-analyses showing that medication-assisted treatment reduced new hepatitis C virus infections by 50%, and it also reduces uh, new HIV infections. I'm not telling you how much it reduces uh, HIV infections because there's a lot of variability in the estimates, and the Cochrane Collaboration didn't uh, produce a, a summary estimate of its effectiveness. Um, Medication-assisted treatment is also strongly associated with retention in treatment and people who are in methadone or buprenorphine are two to three times more likely than those on um, uh, drug-free treatment to uh, remain in treatment over, over time. And that's, that is also an indicator of the success of the program and it's associated with um, reduction in use and abstinence. Uh, methadone and buprenorphine also decrease mortality and the incidence of both fatal and non-fatal overdose in people who use it. And then there's lots of studies showing that um, medication-assisted treatment, methadone, buprenorphine specifically, is cost-effective. That um, you know, it, in terms of the benefits, uh, the benefits are 
are quite substantial in relation to the cost of these programs. Um, buprenorphine is a slightly more cost effective than uh, methadone because it can be administered in an office, office uh, uh, clinician office uh, setting and so there's not the need for people to come back on a daily basis and or almost daily basis and, and receive methadone in a, in a methadone clinic. And it's important to also recall that both methadone and buprenorphine are included in the WHO model list of essential medications and that list is compiled uh, is representing the minimum uh, medication needs for a health care system for, for any country. For all of these outcomes though, it's necessary that people be uh, given adequate doses in order to achieve those results. That's a really important um, effect modifier of the effectiveness of um, both methadone and buprenorphine. And that's been a, that's been a problem. There's in a tendency in some clinics to under-medicate and to not follow clinical guidelines um, with the belief that that's, that that's better for the patient, but in fact uh, people will, will be much uh, healthier and they will have better results if they're uh, given adequate doses. I want to talk about naltrexone. It, this is available in both an oral and, a, and an extended release um, injectable form. It's also known as XR or extended release uh, NTX and the trade name is uh, Vivitrol. This drug is a complete opioid antagonist and for that reason it's far less stigmatized than either methadone um, or buprenorphine and it has and it's far less regulated than methadone or buprenorphine. Um, now Trexone is a relatively new in the treatment for opioid use disorders so there's far less evidence than what we have already for both methadone and bup. And most of the studies of uh, naltrexone have had very uh, relatively small sample sizes and they've also had shorter follow-up periods. So we don't know that much about the long-term, longer-term effectiveness and safety of, of, of naltrexone in, in either formulation. Uh, oral naltrexone has a very high dropout rate. Um, so the, the cost, you know, the, the, cost, the cost is high for naltrexone, it's a newer drug. And so, um, you know, the, with the high, you have to figure in the high dropout rate and, and looking at the cost effectiveness of that drug. Um, but the evidence so far, preliminary data shows that extended release naltrexone um, may be just as effective in preventing relapse and reducing arrest rates as either methanol or bup. But that has to follow, uh, that, that is predicated on um, the assumption that people have completed this initiation or induction period. And the induction period, um, treatment cannot be started until, until patients have had five to seven days of total abstinence from opioids. And that is a real, is a real serious barrier. In a large study that was conducted by the uh, NIH Clinical Trials Network, uh, only 68% of patients were able to um, complete that five to seven day induction period and initiate uh, naltrexone treatment versus 100% of patients who are given methadone or bup. And you know, there's been an argument that this it, that people leaving criminal justice settings might be, in fact, good candidates for naltrexone because presumably most of them or all of them have already, you know, they've already had a period of abstinence lasting at least five to seven days. <clears throat> there's concern and there's not enough evidence yet to, um, to really uh, make a judgment whether or not this, this um, concern is, is, is real, but there's concern that uh, patients who are given extended release naltrexone may be at high risk of overdose if they stop taking it, and that's because it is a complete opioid antagonist, so people have low tolerance, they have zero tolerance for opioids, so that in the in the event that they may, in the event that they may relapse, um, they they you know they if they go back to the street and they and they um, score drugs and it's what they're used to taking, they may be at very very high risk of um, of overdose. But we need to have longer we need to have longer studies with more participants in order to really understand whether that whether that is the case. Um, another problem is that extended release naltrexone is considerably more expensive than either methadone or buprenorphine. The cost of medication alone is about $1,000 a month. So for that reason, it's not as effective, cost effective as either um, 
buprenorphine or methadone. There are a lot of barriers, however, to implementing uh, methadone and buprenorphine. These are very highly stigmatized drugs, um, even after you know, many years of, of studying them and showing that they're both safe and effective. The language used to, used to describe these drugs tends to be uh, tends to reinforce that stigma. It's referred to as drug substitution <coughs> or uh, maintenance medications. And the marketing of, um, in contrast, the marketing <coughs> of naltrexone emphasizes that it's non-addictive and that it's a relapse prevention drug. Alchemies, the manufacturer of Vivitrol, is currently being investigated by the United States Senate for aggressive lobbying of uh, people in drug courts and legislators and um, for tactics that stigmatize both methadone and buprenorphine. Um, they're working very actively with the LBSR to write Vivitrol into state laws so that you know, when, when states write legislation to you know, uh, allocate funding for uh, drug treatment programs, um, Vivitrol is in many cases being written right into those laws as the first line of response to um, treating opioid use disorders. And also, uh, the lobbyists are also uh, attempting to block methadone and bupe by um, inserting language that would require, for example, prior authorization um, before uh, Medicaid will cover uh, either methadone or buprenorphine. Another big problem is that methadone and bupe are among the most heavily regulated and high threshold drugs in the United States. And uh, one way to think about that is that they are much more regulated than the opioids themselves. And at the current time, there are in 13 states in this country, Medicaid coverage does not include um, payment for methadone. All right, so let's talk about syringe service programs. And you can see why I'm, I'm willing to show the slides with, it's gonna be a fast trip through all the, through all the research. So I want you to have, have access to, to all these data. Syringe service, service programs in the United States started around 1988, and they have received endorsement by both national and international organizations, including the National Academy of Medicine, American Nurses Association, American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, American Public Health Association, and internationally by WHO, UNA, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, <coughs> Red Cross, Red Crescent Society, and the World Bank. And that's based on, these endorsements are based on, you know, substantial evidence showing that the programs are both safe and effective. So let's talk about safety first of all. Um, most of the resistance to certain service programs is predicated on the belief that they're going to encourage drug use and increase crime in the community. <clears throat> There's no evidence that uh, these, these programs have done either of those. Um, in fact, syringe service programs can have been shown in studies to reduce drug use in the community because they become a major source of referral to uh, medication-assisted treatment. Um, and the important, one very important aspect of that is the, you know, a lot of people who are, are drawn to syringe service programs who've never been to drug treatment. They've never been in contact with, um, you know, healthcare or social service agencies to begin to address their, um, their, su their substance use. And syringe service programs uh, reach people who, have, who are really out of, out of contact with, with these um, agencies and organizations that can help them. So the net effect of syringe service, service programs in most, most uh, communities where it's been examined has been to uh, demonstrate a, a net effect of decreasing drug use in the community because of its referral to, to uh, substance use treatment. <coughs> syringe service programs also reduce the number of discarded syringes in the community. There was a, a study in Connecticut that showed the needle stick injuries among law enforcement reduced by one third after that syringe service program was opened. And a, a, a similar study in Oregon showed um, the same thing, a two-thirds reduction in discarded syringes. You'll see on the bottom, the citations are all from, you know, mid-1990s mid and early 2000s. And there's not a lot of recent studies on this topic because really that's been sort of, um, it's, it's been kind of settled. You know, a lot of the research began right after the programs were opened in the United States in the late 1980s. And so there was a large number of studies that took place 
um, through like the mid uh, 2000s, and pe people in the pe researchers have moved on to other uh, research questions. So you won't find a lot of very recent um, evidence. Um, perhaps now that we have the opioid crisis in rural areas, there will be more studies, you know, trying to examine the implementation of these programs in rural areas and seeing whether you have any any different results. But there's at this point, I can say there's no reason to believe that they're that, that they pose a safety problem for either users themselves or to the communities. Effectiveness, again, there's been um, multiple studies and multiple scientific reviews of the, of, the, of the evidence, and they've all concluded that, first of all, certain service programs increase safe injection. Um, participants have been uh, shown to reduce syringe and equipment sharing. And equi by equipment, I mean drug cookers, filtration cottons, rinse water, other things that are used to prepare drugs uh, for uh, injection. Syringe service programs prevent HIV transmission, and it's a wonderful story I love to tell about New York City. As you recall, New York City has been the epicenter of um, drug-related HIV infection in the world. At one point, there were between 100,000 and 120,000 um, uh, injection drug users in New York City who were HIV positive. The prevalence was about 50 to 60 percent in the population. And um, now prevalence in New York City is down to around 10%. And that's partially because people are being treated and they're living longer. So prevalence is not likely to go down very quickly. But the rate of new infections in people who inject drugs fell from, you know, when, when, the, when the New York City expanded its syringe service programs from 250 syringes, 250,000 syringes a year to 3 million, the rate of new infections fell from 4% to less than 1% per year. Part of that reduction was owing, owed to the fact that injection drug users who were aware of their HIV status stopped sharing syringes. And uh, Don Desjardins, a colleague in New York City, wrote a paper uh, which was titled Informed Altruism that really characterized that, um, that impulse on the part of drug users to protect uh, people, other people in their community from HIV infection. So a combination of having access to sterile syringes and knowing their status and having the impulse to uh, uh, not transmit it to others is really responsible for this dramatic reduction in HIV transmission. And right now, New York State is, you know, involved in a in a in a campaign to end HIV infection, and really, injection drug users are a very large uh, part of the success of that program. Um, there's many who believe, and I'm one of them, that this HIV outbreak in rural Indiana in 2015-16 would have been prevented if uh, syringe service programs have been in place there. Um, in terms of HCV transmission, uh, you know, HCV is a much more difficult infection to prevent. It seems like uh, injection drug use is the perfect, uh, perfect conditions for the transmission of hepatitis C virus and with very high prevalence of infectious uh, carriers of HCV, about 40% of injection drug users in communities across the United States are um, uh, have HCV viremia. It becomes difficult to prevent HCV, but there was another uh, Cochrane collaboration systematic review that I was involved in showing that the combination of uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and syringe service programs can actually reduce HCV transmission by 75%. And syringe exchange programs are very low cost interventions and they've been shown repeatedly to be highly cost effective. Um, but the effectiveness of, of these programs depends on best practices, following best practices. Just like we want to give adequate doses, dosage with uh, medication-assisted treatment with syringe service programs, we want to follow best practices. And first and foremost, uh, participants must be treated with dignity and respect. Um, the number of syringes and other equipment shouldn't be limited. We want to encourage people to reach out to their networks with uh, clean syringes so that you know, particularly in rural areas, you know, the, where the goal is to try to reach people who are in remote places where their transportation problems may pose a barrier to people coming directly themselves to a program. Um, you know, it's, it's good practice to not limit the number of syringes and other equipment that's um, distributed. Um, to the extent feasible, and this really depends upon funding, you know, you have to have personnel to do some of this. But to the extent that, you, uh, that uh, multiple services, including social services and um, healthcare screening and, and referral to healthcare, the extent that that can be provided, um, that's, that's very important because, again, this is a 
just you don't want to miss an opportunity with people that are otherwise uh, difficult, maybe difficult to reach. Similarly, peer delivered service services in uh, secondary syringe exchange where you know, people who inject drugs are sort of deputized to go out and distribute syringes to their networks. That practice should be encouraged. Um, we should not target the areas surrounding syringe service programs because that will discourage people from, from coming to the sites. Uh, the hours of operation should be based on you know what, what what's needed by, by the by the participants, and public funding of these programs is associated with greater benefits. Public funding generally gen generally means that people have you know there's more funding, that there, and it's more stable funding, right? There's a commitment there, and so programs are able to build you know build around the syringe exchange to offer more um, health and social services. And so that can expand the, the, uh, the benefits um, of, the, of these programs. Let's talk about overdose prevention. Um, you've all seen this graph. Um, I'm really, uh, I'm always struck by the rate of overdose death here in, in West Virginia. Um, <clears throat> we've been, you know, in, in New York City, there's been, um, there's been uh, the, the overdose deaths have been the highest rates have been observed in Staten Island among white people, young whites, who inject drugs. And just in the last year, um, the rates have trended, the epidemiology has really shifted. And now the highest rates of overdose are among African Americans uh, living in the South Bronx. And that's really owing to um, fentanyl, you know, the demon fentanyl, who is, you can see there in that, that sharp spike in fatal overdose is associated with synthetic opioids um, in fentanyl. So that's really what that's really what we're up against here. And fentanyl is not going to go away. You know, we're going to have to adapt to it, just like we've adapted to, you know, other changes in, in drug markets over time with our harm reduction, HIV prevention services. Um, so let's talk first about overdose education and naloxone distribution programs. There's a massive, very good study from Massachusetts that showed that in those communities where more people are trained in, um, you know, how to reverse an overdose and give a naloxone, there's a greater uh, reduction in overdose deaths. And this is a table from that from that study where you can see that the way that they defined high overdose education and naloxone distribution was mm -hmm. in communities where more than 100 per 100,000 population had been trained. Um, and in those communities, they saw a 46% reduction in mortality compared to low implementation communities where it was defined as less than 100, uh, 100 people or less had been trained from 100,000 had been trained. And there they still saw a, a, um, a reduction, 27% reduction in mortality, which is meaningful, of course. That represents a lot of deaths. But, you know, it just really shows very clearly that the more people who are trained including bystanders, family members, community members, you know, the more people who are trained, the, the greater uh, results you can, you can achieve. And people are willing, people are very willing to be trained. I know you've seen that in West Virginia. You've, in some places you've had a tremendous community response and you have, a, you have an outstanding um, uh, naloxone distribution and, and overdose education program here, so you have a lot to be proud of. In Scotland, they provide naloxone to prisoners on release. And that's been associated with a 36% reduction in uh, the portion of deaths among uh, people who were recently released from prison. Um, in New York State, we now uh, issue naloxone to, to everyone upon release from uh, jails and prisons. Um, we don't have data to, to, to show the effectiveness, um, but you know, we're looking at that. And then in both New York City and Rhode Island, and I believe here in West Virginia, and Many other places, uh, you know, we send peer recovery coaches 24 hours a day, seven days a week to non-fatal overdose uh, in, in the emergency departments. And there's, you know, provision of overdose education, naloxone, people are given referrals to um, syringe service programs. In some cases, there can be on-site um, uh, uh, prescribing of uh, buprenorphine and then following up with the patient after 72 hours to maintain that connection because people who have experienced a non-fatal overdose are at about six-fold higher risk of a fatal overdose. So that's a really important um, point, of, uh, point of contact and implementation. 
um, and this implementation of, of, of medication assisted treatment to those patients in the emergency department is shown to increase their engagement and care. So that's, that's a really important finding. Um, but you know, let's keep in mind that we know that we know the evidence surrounding medication assisted treatment. We don't need to prove all over again that medication assisted treatment is going to is going to have these effects. This is really more in terms of a research question, it's more of an implementation research question. You know, under what circumstances, in what settings, and you know, how how can we implement this? Um, Another thing I want to say about overdose education and naloxone distribution, where we could learn more about this, and this is a great place for faculty and students to, uh, to study, is that we haven't really um, standardized the curriculum for overdose, uh, overdose education. And that's something, I think we need to come up with some best practices for overdose education. I mean, the, the people sort of made it up, and, and it's all very good, and clearly it's having an effect. I think we could learn more about, you know, what's the best way to live to deliver that. Okay, overdose prevention centers. This is also known as supervised consumption spaces, uh, safe injection rooms, and so on. Um, these centers provide a hygienic space for people to use drugs under the supervision of trained staff, mostly, uh, in principally including nurses. Nurses typically staff these programs. They're designed to reduce the risk of HIV and hepatitis C transmission. Of course, they're designed to prevent overdose fatalities. People do overdose uh, at, at these settings, but they're um, immediately revived. In Vancouver, they've been, um, they've had overdose, uh, they call them safe consumption sites, safe injection facilities. There's lots of names for them. But they've had them for 30 years, and there's not been a single fatal overdose um, in, any of, in any of those programs. They may also reduce public drug use um, and reduce discarded syringes and crime in the communities where they operate. That's another one of the, their intended goals. And as I mentioned, tra their trained staff include RNs and physician's assistants who actually observe uh, injections. And this is a real important opportunity. I know there's a lot of legal barriers to doing this, but we think, think about it in terms of diabetic education. And when someone learns they're, di they're bi diabetic and they need to start um, injecting insulin, you know, they're, they're observed by a nurse, typically, who give, you know, gives them feedback on their, tra trains them how to, how to do the injection and, you know, offers suggestions in how, how they might, uh, you know, do so, um, you know, comfortably and, and safely and avoid infection. We need to think about ways that we can do that for drug users. Um, there's also the, and this I think is a real important um, aspect of these programs. You know, usually injection is sort of a furtive behavior. It's carried out and, you know, hidden out of anybody's sight. People are ashamed of injecting drugs. And so this is another potential to reduce the shame of drug use and restore dignity. And that will help people become engaged in services um, and seek treatment and um, avoid harms. So we're right now um, uh, working to establish overdose prevention centers, as they're called, safe injection facilities in New York City. We do have a robust overdose prevention and response system. So right now, four people die each day in New York City of an overdose, which is a pretty staggering, staggering number of deaths. 60% um, of fatal overdoses in New York City involve fentanyl. I know you've seen some, you're seeing the same thing here, but that's just two years after the very first cases of fentanyl related deaths appeared in New York City. Now it's 60% of um, deaths involve fentanyl. And there was this really interesting and cool study that was done by the New York City Department of Health where they went and they collected syringes from a syringe exchange program and they tested the syringes for fentanyl and they found that 17% of them tested positive. So you can see that um, there's a, uh, that's sort of the baseline exposure to fentanyl, but you know, fentanyl is clearly, if 60% of deaths involve fentanyl, then fentanyl is uh, clearly um, the culprit here. So in 2017, a group of committed stake stakeholders from advocacy and syringe service programs that came together to demand that New York City and New York State prioritize saving lives and put um, backing and funding into this, and so right now there's a, a research pilot that's proposed, and I'm going to be the lead investigator on that. Before programs in New York City and one in rural Ithaca, upstate, 
the mayors have approved the project, and right now we're waiting for authorization from the New York State Health Commission. And this is very political, you know. People don't want to come out in front of this of this issue, especially during an election year. So we have to wait and see when things calm down. Maybe they'll be willing to um, authorize the programs. So let's talk about the effectiveness of these programs. They are effective at reducing overdose uh, fatalities. Um, as I mentioned, no deaths, no there's no deaths at the uh, Vancouver site in Canada. Um, and there's a really great study showing a 30% reduction in fatal overdoses in the neighborhood surrounding the safe injection facilities in Vancouver versus a 9% over the same period in the rest of Vancouver. In Sydney, most of the research on these programs has come from Sydney and Vancouver. And in Sydney, what they saw was there are fewer overdoses that ha take place during the hours when their safe injection place is open. Um, they typically are placed in neighborhoods with a high rate of overdose, um, and which makes which makes sense to do it there. Um, but and so the community level, we're trying to measure the community level impact in a city like New York City, you know, which has got eight and a half million people and five boroughs. We're looking and we only have four programs each of which only has like six to ten, you know, little kiosks for people to come and inject. Um, that, that's very low capacity re related to the need. Um, so it's going to be a challenge to demonstrate a reduction on a community level in the number of fatal overdoses, but we're going to do our best and locating these, these programs in communities where there's already a high rate of overdose as part of that strategy. Um, they also reduce the risk of HIV and HCV and other infections. Um, people increase hygienic um, uh, practices, there's a re reduction in, uh, in abscesses, and they also act, tend to reach people who are at very high risk of HIV and HCV and people who are already HIV positive that are not in HIV care. So think about that. This is another way to reach out and engage people in other programs and have an impact on HIV transmission and hepatitis C transmission in addition to reducing overdose rates. Safety, this is a really important concern. Um, the evidence indicates that they reduce public disorder associated with drug use, which means reductions in public injection, discarded syringes, and drug-related litter has been shown in both Vancouver and Sydney. They, the programs actively refer people to treatment. Um, here's the evidence uh, regarding that. More frequent use of the program was associated with treatment enrollment in, in Sydney, similar and similarly in Vancouver. <clears throat> There's no real evidence that these programs increase drug use. Most of the participants in these programs have a long history of drug use. And both Vancouver and Sydney, they have been um, monitoring whether there are new, new injectors coming to the program. And typically, the, the enrollment criteria are that you have to have been injecting drugs before you come. You can't come there for the first time and say, oh, I want to start injecting drugs. Can you teach me how? That's not how these programs work. Um, there's also no evidence these programs um, increase drug-related crime, including robbery, property crime, drug, drug offenses, or assault. Um, so the research questions, though, are how do we get overdose education? This is about overdose prevention in, in general, including um, education and naloxone. How do we get those to? How do we get these um, to people at high risk? Um, how do you know social networks of those at high risk of overdose? Um, maybe maybe an idea would be to when you know when we do the peer some peer recovery coaches to people in the emergency departments that we try to you know also recruit members of their social network who may also um, have similar uh, injection practices and you know we, we use them as sort of a um, uh, uh, source of of, um, of training for other people. What about risk compensation? Um, two, there's been, this has been alleged that people, now that Narcan is, is, is available, that people will go out and take risks and they will, they, will, they will inject large numbers of drugs knowing that they can be revived. But there's been a couple of studies that show no increase in, um, in overdose risk behavior after receiving naloxone. And bear in mind, people who use opioids do not want to be given naloxone because they will experience immediate and very uncomfortable withdrawal. Um, so, but studies need to, are needed to look at the perception of risk of compensation among providers because I think 
many providers um, have this belief. Many many people in you know in authority in the community also have this belief. So we need to think about how we're going to address that. You know, and give some assurance that that's not that's not going to happen. Um, there's also a question about dosing of naloxone. You know, especially in response to fentanyl, where you know it's been reported that people require many more doses of, of naloxone if they've um, injected um, fentanyl. In New York City, in some of the needle exchange programs, they're using oxygen as a first line response, and that's successful in most of the cases that they observe. Um, again, we talked about the need for uh, standardized curricula on overdose education. And also, you know, we have to think about how we're going to continually adapt these overdose education and lots of distribution programs to this changing drug supply. You know, we know that this is a moving target with fentanyl and carfentanyl and, and, and everything else. So we have to, you know, we have to be, you know, willing to be uh, um, agile and um, nimble in, in our response. And then there's another research question, which is, what is the impact of treating an overdose as a crime scene? Because right now NYPD does uh, investigate um, overdoses as um, homicides, and that may have a, um, a, a deleterious effect on people calling 911. And we're of course really concerned about that. Um, so in summary, and I know I don't want to take up anybody else's time. There's vast evidence of the safety, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness of all of these pro of these two programs: methadone, buprenorphine, and syringe service programs. Um, we know that applying the principles of harm reduction, being non-judgmental, non-coercive, and following best practices, in the case of MAT, adequate dosing, those both oh, those all increase the effectiveness of these programs. Um, although naltrexone and Vivitrol is really being hyped and um, encouraged, we don't know enough at this point about its safety or effect effectiveness to give it this an unqualified endorsement. There's very consistent evidence, evidence of the safety and effectiveness of overdose education, naloxone distribution, and although the, 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 we need to study these overdose prevention centers in the United States, the evidence so far um, is, suggests that these programs are both safe and effective. And then finally, I want to leave, leave with this final thought, which is addressing the stigmatization of drug use is going to lower barriers to effective responses to this opioid crisis. So thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Hagen for that terrific uh, cru cruise down the evidence highway. Uh, now we'll see if our next speaker decides to pull us over or not. Uh, <laughs> happy to welcome. Happy to welcome Deputy Sheriff Donnie Varnell. Donnie. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm really happy. I'm also glad to be here. I, I feel fairly privileged to be in between Dr. Hagen and Dr. Ramsey. I have DR in front of my name also, but it's my initials that's Donnie Randall. So I apologize in advance for what you're going to get from my presentation when, instead of listening to the two doctors speak. Uh, and, I, and I wholly uh, support everything you heard Dr. Ray, uh, Hagen say. I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of law enforcement. Uh, and I was told I had to have slides, so you've got slides now. And <laughs> uh, so you know a little bit how I got here very quickly is uh, I'm from rural North Carolina. My family is from the Appalachian Mountain Range of North Carolina, so these mountains don't scare me. The snow kind of got my attention, though, on the way in. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I worked for, uh, Uncle Sam paid me to jump out of airplanes for a little while when I was young, uh, sent me to some exotic places and let me shoot artillery and stuff like that. And then I was in the State Bureau of Investigation uh, where I eventually became a special agent in charge for the statewide drug unit. Uh, and, you know, we were pretty busy. As you can imagine, there was a drug problem. Even in 1985, there was a drug problem. Uh, now, all that jumping out of airplanes and stuff, seemed like a really good idea when I was 21 years old. And when you get to be 60, you now have to see the other side of the opioid world because, trust me, when used correctly, those things work, right? I mean, you know, 
When a doctor prescribes them correctly, you use them correctly, and then don't keep using them, it allows you to heal. It allows me to sleep because I've had an operation or two. And I, won't, I used to get people to raise their hands, and then somebody told me I was, you know, stigmatizing people by getting out. So I can't. Don't raise your hand. Whatever you do. All right. So uh, when I was in the, the state of investigation, uh, I walked into the opioid crisis. That was what I got given in 2009. Uh, and that's how I got involved with harm reduction. Uh, and where I now, I retired from the Bureau, and I went with the Dare County Sheriff's Office after I worked full time with harm reduction. Uh, because, well, I know the sheriff and he pays me for doing it and it doesn't affect my retirement with the state. Uh, but I'll tell people this. I am the, depending on where I'm at and who I'm talking to, any law enforcement? Well, it would be on the back row, so that's, okay, all right. Uh, so when I speak to law enforcement uh, communities, I'm that hippie cop, right, because I work with harm reduction people. And in North Carolina, harm reduction is an alternative group to law enforcement. In North Carolina, law enforcement is usually adversarial at best, confrontational at worst, with the harm reduction community, right? Because we are all dealing with the same community, but in really different ways, right? That's how it started with us. Uh, and so when I'm with the harm reduction world, like when I go to some harm reduction conference, I still dress the same way. I don't pretend to be somebody I'm not. And then I become that North Carolina cop guy with the North Carolina harm reduction people. So I get it from both sides. I will tell you that it has been extraordinarily rewarding for me to step out of the law enforcement world and get into the harm reduction world, right? Suddenly I'm really doing what I, well, I got in law enforcement because I like blue lights and sirens and I like kicking indoors too, right? I mean, but I do like helping people. And you know what? You really start helping individual human beings. This is a national crisis with individual tra tragic stories, right? And, in, and while we talk about huge programs, and the New York program for syringe exchange programs is what we, we base all our stuff on. Because you buy, Robert Childs used to work for you. He's, he's our harm reduction director for the longest time. Or uh, used to work for New York. We have these big national programs and problems we talk about, and I always try to tell people there's no perfect program. Right? Law enforcement's not perfect. Harm reduction's not perfect. Medicine's not perfect. But you try to help as many individuals as you can help. Right? So, and that's kind of how, that's what I was looking at when I was in law enforcement. Uh, we're going to talk about the scope of the problem, what I originally did with the opioid crisis, and the shift that we took in about 2013, 2014, we did a shift in law enforcement in North Carolina, and how the policy of change took place. Uh, you, everybody has to have a chart in their, in their uh, slideshow, so here's your chart. And it's uh, colorful, may I add? Uh, and, and this is that beast we all talk about. When I first started in law enforcement, uh, you, there was heroin, but we chased cocaine when we first started uh, in law enforcement. I chased cocaine like a cocker spaniel chases a tennis ball. We arrested so many people for crack cocaine. I mean, I did 50 kilo deals, 100 kilo deals, and we were high-fiving, and you know, 12 days later, we were doing another 50 kilo deal, right? And, and when you're young like that, it's just, you're just going with the game. You're playing the game. You're fighting the dragon. And everything is just so much fun, right? As you get just a little bit older, you start to realize there's no cop on earth that has not used the phrase, he'll be back on the street before I finish the paperwork, or for everyone I arrest, who takes the place. It's the old Hydra analogy, right? Well, I have a criminal justice degree. So I'm not saying I'm really smart. I know my primary colors and I can lift heavy things, but I realized really early we were kind of knocking our head against the wall on substance abuse issues, right? And remember, there's always, ever since uh, 1915 and 1932, there's been laws on the book dealing with substances, right? The war on drugs from the 70s just, and, and I always say this, police did not start the war on drugs. Politicians did that they made these new batch of laws and pushed them into law enforcement and we implemented them. Now, we fight that battle. I've never really called it war on drugs. And then if this was a meme, it would see me also, you literally just said war on drugs. But to me, it wasn't a war. I mean, I was just doing individual things at a time to try to clean up community, right? And I want everyone to realize that although I solely support harm reduction, I know that there is a law enforcement part to this equation, 
right? There are generally bad people in this world. I know them. I've met them. I've seen them face to face. And they make their fortunes on the misery and addiction of other people. And some of them don't need to be out here with us. But the person is an individual that is living day to day just trying not to be sick. And we do understand that when, if you have a serious substance abuse disorder, you're not getting high anymore. Do we realize that? We don't want to be sick. I've watched mothers purchase heroin for their pregnant daughters so they wouldn't get sick. And you say to yourself, no way, never happened. You don't understand the kind of sick we're talking about. No, no matter how sick you've ever been, it's worse than that. Right? And you know that all you've got to do, if all you had to do was take a, anybody ever have a toothache? Now you can raise your hand. Anybody had a real toothache, 3 o'clock in the morning at a conference in Raleigh? Would you have taken a white pill to make that pain go away? Most of us go, oh, you bet. Right? I've been there. So we realize that the problem doesn't go away because we make it against the law. Uh, this shows that uh, when I first started, heroin was a 55 or 45-year-old black male. And now we all know that it is probably 35 to 45-year-old opiates or 35 to 45-year-old white males. And I will tell you, part of the reason this crisis is so public now is because fine, upstanding people started overdosing and dying. Right? I mean, I, there's good and bad parts of everything. If I'm telling you something you've never heard before, I'm sorry. But once the high school quarterback started dying in Morgantown, West Virginia, or wherever it was, because it happened in Greensboro, that became front page news. Right? Well, people have been dying of cocaine and methamphetamine for 60 years, and nobody really cared. So, so here's what we were seeing in North Carolina. You see these huge spikes kept going up. Thank you, uh, Donnie was really appreciative that that's kind of where I took over the unit. Uh, and, and we finally got it down right there. And I tell people this, I always take complete full credit for that. <laughs> so, if anybody ever asked, that was Donnie Varnell in North Carolina. Uh, but what we really found out, one of the reasons was uh, Oxycontin, right, hillbilly heroin. I can say hillbilly because I have hillbillies in my family. Uh, look, my, my family in up in the mountains, it was like a ZZ Top concert. So, uh, uh, so uh, we dealt with, we were dealing with Oxycontin, and we finally got uh, Harold Rogers, I believe is his name. He's a senator from Kentucky. He's also in charge of all the money in Congress at, at that time. Like this right here. We got him on board. Well, Kentucky has an opiate problem, which you guys may have heard, right? And he finally got the FDA involved. He brought them in front of 800 people at a conference, the director of the FDA, by the way, who decides how you make medicine, right, what the formulation is, and said, you will either come to the table or you will be the meal in front of 800 people. And suddenly Oxycontin had its process changed. So now if you try to crush it up, you know that's what we do with pills, right? We crush it up, we put it in water, and we heat it to get the impurities out of it, and we pull it up in a spike, and we inject it through cotton, or we pull it up through cotton and inject it, well, they made Oxycontin, which was the king on the street, right, because you could get 160 milligram Oxycontin. They made it so if you put water on it, it kind of turns into paste, and you can't inject it. Well, it took, our, it took North Carolina, it took us about 9 to 12 months to figure out what we wanted after that. So I think our rate went down a little bit. So you can see fentanyl is, is the real deal. Uh, in North Carolina, we tested Wilmington, which is our worst area for opioid overdoses, and 80% of everything we tested, burners, cottons, syringes, and dope, right, we actually would get the people would bring us the bags to check, 80% uh, of everything had fentanyl in it. With people going, no, you're wrong, my guy doesn't sell me fentanyl. I mean, I've been buying from him for eight years. I'm <laughs> going, brother, fentanyl. Know what you're, at least you know what you're using, right? And the fentanyl test strips are kind of taken over now. Uh, this just shows you the ripple effect. You guys have seen all this stuff. Uh, for every one death, you see we start having hospitalizations. Uh, ED visits for overdoses, almost three for every death. We actually have almost 15 people go to the hospital on a substance issue for every death, right? But they don't get listed as overdoses, right? Because you bring your 12-year-old daughter in and it's, she's acting wonky. But it, it turns out it'd be substances. Uh, and this isn't a test question, but there's about 9 to 11 million people live in North Carolina depending if it's summertime where I live, I live at the beach. In the summer, our, you know, our population goes up a couple of million just in my county, I think. 
So we have an opioid prescription for almost every man, woman, and child in North Carolina every year. You, I'm sure you're the same. I, I'd be shocked if you weren't almost right on par, or, or I'm, maybe worse. I don't know who knows the numbers. Uh, one thing that was telling to me is six out of ten young people from 18 uh, years old and lower that go to the ER now, in, or, or the ED, I'm aging myself. Anybody know who Captain Kirk is? Sure. Okay. Have they, made, they made the new movie, right? They made the movie. New, see, the old movie, nobody knew Kirk was anymore. Uh, six out of ten young people that go to the ED are for a substance issue in North Carolina. Used to, I couldn't go to the ED unless I broke a bone playing football. All right, everything else got dirt rubbed on it, or that red stuff on that little glass tip. That yeah, mercuricum. Yeah, there's my nurse's mercuricum. Woo! All right, so, and I and just like you heard the doctor say, our hepatitis C rate was up 700 percent, HIV rate was up 500 percent. And if you don't believe HIV, uh, hepatitis C is the real deal, in North Carolina, it's Duke Carolina uh, base, uh, basketball. This is really special, venomous kind of hate, right? And everybody watches the game. When it's the tickets, the box tickets, $18,000. They sell them all day on Amazon, wherever, just to go to a basketball game. I'm sure you have some similar event here. It also means everybody in the state watches that game on TV. It's better than the Super Bowl by far, trust me. Right? And I noticed one day there's this commercial. Tell me if you're seeing it. Do you want to be cured of your hepatitis C? It shows a young black female, business lady, with her briefcase, walking into a really nice office building. Young white guys, uh, middle-aged black guy. We can help you with hepatitis C. You can be cured if you get this medicine. If you haven't seen that commercial, that commercial is not for the stereotypical street person that is using heroin or fentanyl, right? That is for me because I have insurance. So I can buy that medicine that is being advertised at halftime of the Duke Carolina basketball game, right? So that shows you, if you can't, that doesn't show you the hep C problem has exploded in this country, that they're selling, they're selling hep C medication to this room, right? So that shows you where the problem is to me. Uh, and also remember, and I'll cover this one time before, uh, the statistics or the studies we saw show that to uh, treat a hep C or an HIV patient for a lifetime, can be $500,000 or more. Now, there's medical people here who probably know the number right down to the penny, right? So you think of those costs, and very often those costs are being covered by other payments, right? People can't afford that insurance. They either don't have any insurance or they have a subsidized insurance, but they're still being treated. So think about the cost to the medical community, which is then put off into the, uh, to the regular public, right? And that's important later. Enforcement policy. I tell people this, uh, all law enforcement have three things, and I'm being, it's being simplistic and I apologize, but we all have our training. There is no federally mandated training for law enforcement. West Virginia State Police are trained different than the North Carolina Highway Patrol. Now, we all get kind of the same thing, and I, your sheriff's department here is trained different than your police department here. It's close, but it's different. But we all have our training. I will tell you that an FBI agent is trained different than your local deputy sheriff. They both do spend about 24% of their time on self-defense and enforcement, hands-on, that stuff you see on TV stuff. We all do kind of do that a lot because that's important, by the way. You hope you never have to use it, but if you have to use it, you want to have it. Uh, so we all have our training. We all have the tools that we are given to do our job. People think gun, radio, flashlights, computers, everybody has Every cop I know now has 15 computers and three cell phones and they text and all kinds of stuff. I started, I had to pull up to a pay phone, reach out of the window. I wasn't on horseback. <laughs> I'd reach out of a window and it, I had 18 numbers. And if I ever had to think about it, I couldn't do it. But I could do 18 numbers to make a, a pay call on a pay phone to whoever I was trying to check in with. That's how it started long for me. But we all have our tools. And part of our tools are our options. Right? That's the laws that you vote on to be passed. Whatever that law, the last law you saw on a referendum, that's you, right? You make the laws and we have to enforce them. It all comes to us. That's one of our tools. And then we have direction. Direction comes from everywhere. Direction comes from the chief of police. Direction comes from the mayor. Direction comes from my wife, right? I get all kinds of direction. And you, if you wonder why cops do things, 
Uh, anybody ever had a speeding problem in your neighborhood? Right? Kids out from driving like bats out of you know where? Right? Well, when Miss McGillicuddy calls the chief and says they're driving like crazy up and down my street, the chief calls me and I put one of my patrolmen, he gets a radar gun, and next thing you know, you get popped for speeding in an area you've never ever seen a cop before, right? Because you're going 35 and a 25. If I point at you, can we agree you're not a lawbreaker? I apologize. For that. You're not a drug user or a drug distributor or a speeder because I know you doesn't speed, right? Correct. Ever. Me either, by the way. <laughs> I tell people I have master badge. It is accepted in most counties if I'm speeding. So we have those things. And when we show up to do drug enforcement, it's because we've been directed to do that. Right? And I will tell people this all the time. With the three things that you've given law enforcement, they're really good at what they do. <laughs> they might not do it the way you wanted them to do it, We've all had a negative contact with law enforcement, probably. I have. I've been pulled over by people that thought I was driving too fast. You know, they weren't very friendly about it. That's okay. You know, I, I had to live with that. But we all do a good job of what you give us. The best thing about law enforcement is we do not care who you are. If you ring the bell, we come. My computer does not tell me how much money you make a year. It doesn't tell me where you graduated from college. Because if it said Duke, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> right? It doesn't tell me any of that. Right? It does, it, all I do is see the address, there's trouble, unresponsive subject, and we haul butt, blue light and sirens. Best thing about law enforcement. To this day, it's the best thing I've ever seen. So, traditional approach, we arrested everybody we could. Absolutely. <laughs> I've arrested more people than in this room times 10, I guarantee you. Right? I, I filled this room up with cocaine. Oh, well, not with cocaine. Close. I filled it up with marijuana at least once. It was a time that marijuana was bad. I don't know if y'all remember that. You see, you shouldn't have marijuana. We used to arrest you for that. <coughs> and when the drug came, we did the same thing. I arrested doctors, nurses, pharmacists. That was really my job. High profile, mayors, cops. I've arrested numerous police officers that were addicted to substances after being in car wrecks, for being shot, and then they get addicted to the medicine they were prescribed. The stereotypical addiction story. We've all heard it. Right? But it did not work. My overdose rate wouldn't go down. My arrest rate soared, which I was getting patted on the back for, by the way. But my agents were drowning in cases. Drowning in cases. We were at saturation arrest. There was nothing else we could do. And it was kind of just, it was frustrating. So we had to find something else. Now, there's another traditional approach you've seen. I'm telling you, to this day, drug task forces work just the same way they did 35 years ago. <coughs> just cooler stuff. They still, they're still that guy with the rat tail, though, that's in every NARC unit. I don't, I don't know who he is. He's, he's off. All right, so we did this. We shifted. I met with my senior uh, agents, and I met with some of my supervisors, and I met with some people at the Department of Justice. Remember, North Carolina is a red state. When I started this, from the governor down was Republican. Conservative and pretty hard conservative Bible Belt Republican right from the top to finish. First time in 200 years North Carolina had been completely Republican. But we sat down and my thought was, how do we save one life? How do I make it go from 1,300 a year, which is now almost 14, to 1,299? I said, if we can get it down 10 people, I'll build you a statue and put it on the Capitol grounds for you that you saved 10 lives. Right? And we started, and what we found was this. We had to educate Right, we educated police officers to start with, and then we would give training to any group, anywhere, anytime. If you had three people at the Presbyterian Women's Lunch, I would show up and I would give what I knew about opiates. Right? If you had a peer-to-peer a -peer meeting and you wanted law enforcement to come show up and be a representative of law enforcement, I'd show up. So we did education. We started to meet with other groups. This group. I know more about medicine and emergency medicine than I ever dreamed. I just thought EMS is you know, they just took a lot of naps and showed up late to car wrecks. That's what I thought EMS did. It didn't turn out they worked a lot, right? Maybe they worked a little bit more than I did. I don't know how you lift those guys up and down those little bitty steps. So, all right, but we met with EMS, uh, medical uh, associations. In North Carolina, the, Amer the uh, medical, uh, the Physicians Association or Medical Association, extraordinarily powerful lobbying group, right? Uh, regulatory agencies, and we started changing regulations. Right? And we started training, uh, uh, changing the training that they were giving in medical facilities. Best practices, right? I think every state's done some version of that, correct? How to prescribe correctly. 
Because, you know, we can trace that memo back to 1978 that everybody used to say opiates were okay. Because remember, even in the 30s, we knew opiates were bad, really bad. And somewhere that changed. In 1960, you couldn't get a strong opiate unless you, were, you had cancer. Nobody ever heard of getting opiates for a broken finger or anything. And then we just started, we all know how that worked, right? So we shifted to get out of traditional law enforcement to find other programs that would work. And I found Robert Childs at a conference, sitting with the SWAT team commander of Fayetteville Police Department, right? United States Marine, Bulldog, all his gold on. And I immediately connected with him, correct? Because I jumped out of planes. I mean, I'm a fan, right? And now Robert was a little different. <laughs> Robert had uh, an English, New Zealand kind of accent. You know Robert? Have you ever met Robert? Yeah. Robert's got this really, I'm smart, English accent, dresses, a little different. And I immediately was trying to figure out why this cop was with this guy. But he gave him credibility to me. That's my boss. I admit it completely. But Robert knows how that works. And that's how we did this policy of change. I found Robert. Robert heard me speak saying, I'm trying to find another way. There's got to be something. I, I don't know if I coined the phrase, you can't arrest your way out of this, but I was close. Right? Because there's a lot of cops that want to hear me say that. Right? There's a lot of police officers that thought we could just arrest more people, build more jails. We've, com we've, com we've made a uh, complete industry of incarceration in, in America. Any given day, one out of 100 people are in jail. You think about that, right? So we, we made a plan. What it is we wanted to do, now what you want to do is up to you, but we knew we had to put harm reduction into the equation as quickly as possible. How, how close am I? Anybody know? Am I like 10 minutes? Okay, 5, 10. Okay, and the message and the messenger. I'm really good to go talk to the governor. I'm really good to go talk to the senator that runs the money and the program. You don't want me going to a peer-to-peer -peer meeting and telling them how to behave. Right? I reek of law enforcement. Right? So, but my job in harm reduction was to go to those people that made the political decisions and to go to law enforcement and try to convince them that harm reduction was a, at least a possibility, which I was glad to do. We used evidence-based studies, what Dr. Hagen is saying. Cops, senior execs, they want to read and see a statistic that shows that it works because they've got to stand up in front of their commissioners or their elected citizens for the citizens that elected them and say, this will work. And then we did use evaluation. Every six months, we do a big PR release about how all the benefits that have happened. We started with naloxone. We gave naloxone for free to every police department agency in North Carolina that would take it. I would go and train them, and then I would speak one-on-one -on -one to the chief in a private meeting where he could vent, and I wouldn't judge him. And then I would convince him that not only was the locks on a good idea because it was saving lives and it would save police officers' lives, but then I could speak to him about syringe exchange programs. And I could say, hey, how about fair chance hiring? Have you ever thought about diverting people from jail to treatment programs and then you never have to deal with them again? Right? And that worked for us. We found that once you had lunch with somebody and talked about each other's kids, it was really hard to be mad at each other for no reason, right? And we did that in every environment we could. Every harm reduction meeting, every police meeting, that's what we did. Now, the lockdown was a success. Well, absolutely. We've had over 20,000 documented rescues from the naloxon we've put on the street. Three and a half years ago, not one police officer in North Carolina carried naloxone. Not one. Now we're number two in the nation. We've had over 1,000 reversals from just law enforcement. So we know it works, and now it's not, do you carry naloxone? It's why don't you carry naloxone in North Carolina? So when you hear someone talk about safe injection sites, well, what do we call them? Overdose prevention locations. I like that's a very good verb. That's out of the realm of law enforcement. We're, that's outside our box. We're having a problem with that. But I tell people three years ago naloxone was the same way. It was the exact same thing, and nobody would have believed we did syringe exchange programs in North Carolina. So, did we get syringe exchange? First time through, it was legalized, right? And we passed a law that said anybody in the state could uh, set up a syringe exchange program as long as they followed three rules, which was to report and uh, dispose of your narcotics and have a safety plan. We made it, there was no public funding either. Remember that, that that's bad because we couldn't get any public funding, but it's good that we were able to do it with no public funding. There's people and grants and, and and resources available if you look. 
right? And our health departments wanted to help us to start with, but couldn't. And we've had the law amended, so now health departments, if they feel, and local government, if they want to, will give us money. And now that has started. So the syringe exchange programs in North Carolina have been vastly uh, successful. And you know what? It hasn't affected law enforcement one bit. I tell people one of the biggest things about law enforcement and harm reduction is we just have to step out of the way. Law enforcement, harm reduction really isn't our job. We don't counsel very well. We don't have time. I don't know what your treatment plan should be. I don't know what medication you should be on. I believe in medication, but I don't know what, I don't know. But if I will just allow other people to do the work, I can go back to being a cop. And so when you call for a home invasion at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not at the magistrate's office with a marijuana arrest going, man, can you call for mutual aid to the next town over and hopefully it'll get there in 26 minutes and everybody's going to be okay, right? I'm law enforcement. I like people to wave at me when I come through the neighborhood too. I like for you to use all five fingers. It would be nice. <laughs> right? I should have been a fireman, I guess, huh? Right, so syringe exchange programs, do they really work? Of course they work. You see our HIV rates in North Carolina. They were up by 80% and uh, uh, C rates were up by 50%. That stopped, right? We were lowering them now by almost 80%, 50%. Uh, participation, they're four to five times more likely to seek services. And I never say rehab, and, I, and I, I'm so glad she talked about stigmatizing people and stuff. If you tell me, hey, Donnie, you're kind of heavy, you know, you may shit the gym, you kind of lost me because I heard you say fat. <laughs> right? Right? All right? I can't stay on a diet for seven days, but I want you to kick your eight-year heroin habit right now. Just stop. Put it down. And go be, what? Clean. And if you're not clean, you're dirty, right? You lost me at dirty. Trust me, and I've been called that before. I don't want to have this conversation. So we do treat, we have something called crisis intervention training that every law enforcement officer in North Carolina now is mandated to get to teach you how to speak to people, right, in their environment. Uh, in my program in Dare County, we have 78%, 78 people in, listed in the program, and 22 of them have sought services. What other program in America takes people with substance disorders and gets that kind of number to seek treatment. Syringe exchange program is the only one I've seen. It's the only, and it's like that in Greensboro where we have 400 people in the program. The number is almost always between 18 and 28 percent seek services. Right? Fantastic. Uh, reduced number of uh, sticks. That was a great selling point when we, we did the bill. Uh, decreases the number of discarded needles. And it can contribute to lower crime rates. Because the people that are, have uh, chronic substance disorders often have negative contacts with law enforcement. If we can get them out of that circle, then we don't have to deal with them anymore. And finally, the unforeseen happened. My narcotics task force, which is large and aggressive and young, wanted to meet with the syringe exchange program people. I went, no, <laughs> no, I don't want you in the rooms. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I love you guys. And I don't trust you to say the right thing. And they pushed it till we had it. By the time they were done, I had left because it was late, and they were having coffee. They became people to each other. And our syringe exchange program is run by peers, either have been active users or still active substance users. Right? And now they became people. Now they call each other when they have issues. Right? And if it happened in Dare County, boys, the great republic of Dare, it can happen anywhere. Which it hurts me when I hear law enforcement started it and then stopped. That's our programs. They're all over the country. You see, we're doing, we cover about 60 counties out of 100. We're working on it. That is my real email and my real cell phone number. <laughs> uh, again, I appreciate your time. If you ever want to, we also started the LEAD program, which is Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, which now is in seven different counties. We're the leading state in America where instead of arresting this young man for the third time, I'd now ask him would he like to go get services to help him. I put him in the car, I take him to a crisis center, and I drop him off. I take his dope. He, can't, he cannot take that. We won't let him. We're not that far along, North Carolina. Well, I, but he gets to go to a service program, and I never see him again. And in law enforcement, that's a win, right? And we've helped the individual. Uh, so that's a whole different program. If you ever want to hear about it, uh, I'll be glad to. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Come on over. I apologize. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Donnie. Uh, our final speaker will be uh, Dr. Ramsey. I also want to let folks know um, we will be having um, a panel conversation after Bill's presentation. We do not have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Uh, this room is open to us uh, to extend beyond that period of time. So please stick with us. Um, and uh, Bill. Thank you. I'll try it. Can you hear me okay? Is that working? I didn't know if it was. I got it on there. So, wow, what, what, what great, uh, both of you, what great. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to get to be here too. I guess I'm the token in West Virginia. But uh, I, I did, I'm a medical person, obviously, as you know, so I share with that. <coughs> I don't know if you don't know or haven't known me a long time. I spent a lot of time on the streets too. So uh, I was a paramedic for many years uh, in my early career and uh, gave a lot of naloxone. Back in those days, it was usually because we gave them too much more than it because we were trying to wake them up. But now that's changed a lot too. What, what you need to understand and what I'm going to try to communicate is we kind of top this off and we go into the panel discussion. Is I'm not an addiction expert, and I'm not a law enforcement expert, I'm not a harm reduction expert. Uh, and there's a lot of people in here and probably listening online that uh, are better at overall community engagement. But what I hope to bring with you is describing this project we did here in the last year and a half or so, and, and give you some concrete, tangible insights into how you can take some of these things, and a lot of this is intuitive, but I want to give you some, just, just try to put yourself in a position where you can think about, what does this really mean? That's what we have to do. You know, Dr. Hagen said it, Donnie said it, you've got to connect. I love to think about having coffee. It could be another story about that, but I, I won't do that right now. So, where'd that clicker go? There it is. Is it on? I'm not coming through. I didn't turn it off. Is that better? No? Not working? Is it working? Can you hear it? Is it working now? Yes. Coming through? We okay. can hear you now. Okay, good. Sorry about that. So, uh, must have got flipped off there. So, I can tell I'm doing it now. So, uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to start right through this. My purpose in the next few minutes, and I'll try to be brief to catch us back up a little, but I want to introduce you to this project that we called Where's Waldo? I want to summarize the process and the insights and findings of the project. But then I want to describe how these insights might really help us kind of inform our perceptions, our attitudes, our approaches, our strategies to not just substance use disorder, but harm reduction. And you've heard a lot of that. So that's the plan. And I'll do that quickly, but I think it's really important. Background on this, President Gee and Dr. Marsh, as part of their charge uh, a year and a half ago, um, asked us to look at what we could do to contribute to this particular crisis in a slightly different way. And I was very privileged to get to work with this team and help lead uh, President uh, Emeritus Dr. David Hardesty, who I think is actually tuned in from down there in North Carolina somewhere, uh, watching today. Uh, Tom Haywood with Bowles Rice, who was our pro professional facilitator. And then Sarah Warfield, who's right there. Raise your hand, Sarah, was a part of this team. She's an MPH and a PhD candidate. And Helen Matheny, who works with me now, uh, as the Director of Collaborative Relations. So that was our team. And this, of course, if you haven't seen it, is Where's Waldo? I know this is a serious topic, but it's a real topic. So this is real. And you know, if you remember the kids' book, Where's Waldo? There's this little guy, and you've got to find him. So if you think about this whole crisis, it's really quite a mess to see. And you've got to try to find him. And so there was a so-called Waldo rationale that developed many years ago that said in every situation or organization, sometimes there's a few things that if you change them, you would transform the situation or the organization for better. But like the children's book, if you've ever done your kids with this, it's hard to find sometimes. And so, yeah, all these points are good, but are there something we're missing here? So that was the approach and why we called it the Where's Waldo Project. A guy named George Bennett, who's an alum from here, coined that term many years ago when he was at Bain and Boston Consulting. And George is a good friend of ours, and, and he helped inform that. So what I want to talk about for just a couple minutes, and everybody says, oh, I, I know some of you are already thinking who, who get into this and do the community. Well, I know about focus groups. I know about 
professional facilitation. There's nothing new here. What I'm going to show you is there is a twist to this that we thought was really important when we designed this for this particular crisis. And that was we used it to convene the groups, the stakeholders, to openly share and discuss their experiences. We used the professional facilitation, but we had some very unique and specific guidelines about how we did this. And it was held over an eight-month period. We were in five different places in West Virginia. They were diverse regions. They were intentionally small. About 20 people were stakeholders, and we had almost 100 stakeholders when we finished the process. Now, what was unique about this? There's the locations. There's nothing. Don't feel left out if your county isn't there. This was kind of a general thing. You'll notice it is heavily concentrated in, in the southern part of the state. But we also had the north central area and the eastern panhandle. But what we did was we looked at, through contacts, through personal contacts, like, like uh, Donnie said, through personal contacts, who are the people that are dealing with this boots on the ground? Boots on the ground. And if you look at this, this is the list. Who's in academics? Who's in addiction treatment? Who's in recovery or actively problem? Who's the affected population? Who are the businesses? Corrections, parole, drug court, faith community, judicial system, law enforcement, first responders, legal community, medical community, public health, education, volunteers, so on and so on. How do we identify who are those people? And you know as well as I do, no offense to the people listening or others, it usually isn't, it isn't always the mayors and the politicians, it's the boots on the ground people that really know what's going on with this a lot of times. The law enforcement in the field, the EMS in the field, the docs in the field. This is just shows, I had to have a chart too. Uh, uh, but this kind of shows you that it's a pretty diverse and although of course the medical community is a little bit more because of the way some of those cross, but it's a pretty rainbow spectrum, isn't it, of all the different stakeholders. These are the unique guidelines and I've talked to several folks. We, we, cl we collaborated on a lot of things with Stanford and, and Berkeley and uh, 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 <laughs> a little bit with Duke. Nah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyway, and, and, and they had really not heard of some of these kind of techniques. First off, very carefully identified. We wanted these stakeholders to be very carefully identified on a personal one-on-one -on -one level. And by having knowledge of the state and being in the state and with the group, we were, we were able to do that. Second, this was an invitation only. This was not a public meeting. This was not a publicized focus group. This was one-on-one -on -one communication with those people there were no group emails. It was usually telephone or in person and said, here's what we want to do. Will you come and do this? We are 100% <laughs> doing it that way. Believe that once we identified it. There was no press. There was no publicity. This was not a time for people to grandstand. And you know how that happens sometimes <laughs> in public meetings. We, the invitees, didn't matter who they were. I mean, we had a federal judge that attended this. They were not allowed to send a representative. So in other words, you could say, oh, you know, I'm going to have you come. But that person says, no, no, I'm going to send my deputy. Nope. Wrong. Don't work. If you can't come, tell us we have someone else on the list in that stakeholder category, and we go to that person. Okay? Sessions were recorded, carefully transcribed. The people agreed to do that. They were kept intentionally short to a half a day. We gave them lunch. The other thing was, with one exception, we did not tell them who else was coming. So they had no clue who they were walking into the room with. Okay? I mean, they had a general idea as the word got around what the stakeholders were, but they didn't know that. That was intentional because sometimes you'll find these little rub points and until you have them sitting down, talking to coffee, you know, they might say, I ain't going to that because Donnie's going to be there. You know? So we, we weren't trying to trick anyone, but, but, but we, we did it that way. We did not send them any literature. We were not interested in trying to influence them. Didn't send them something about naloxone or our law enforcement program or, or you know, treatment or rehab. We wanted them for what they knew already and what they were living, if that makes sense. So we did not taint the, the pool by sending information. We just kind of described what it was like. 
And then we use the professional neutral facilitation techniques and the real-time summary and that sort of thing. So, I, I, it takes a lot longer to explain in more detail, but you get the drift, right, about what this is. So, what were our findings? What did we see? What were the insights? I've distilled this a lot. And it's no surprises to you, there isn't a single wall there. We know that, right? <coughs> we know that. However, and that's where this fits in, I think, nicely with the previous speakers and what you folks that are dealing with these situations where you're trying to implement programs and you don't get total agreement, how you move forward. When you, when you approach it, and this is what a Waldo thing looks like, by the way, he's right there. But they put these distractors. But when you, when you pay attention to the whole thing, if you look very carefully at each spot, you begin to see something. There's something there. And so there's, there's actually multiple Waldos, uh, if you want to think of it that way. And these were the three key themes. It's so interesting, Dr. Hagen. Um, could go through your slides, and, and this is really how we've used this information, is really confirmatory. It, it shows, un, unknown to folks, but these are real issues. Look at this. The issue, and now these are summarized and condensed, so you say, well, of course. But yeah, of course. And almost 100 people said this. It's complex, it's multidimensional. Any successful strategy, and you heard it all over the place here this morning, any successful strategy has to have change. It has to have broad collaboration, communication, cooperation amongst the parties. I'm sorry, it's just what it is. That's the way it has to be. And they heard it over and over again. Solutions have to come at the community level. We can do things, but it's those people on the ground in the communities who have to get energized. And this one's really important too. You can give them the basic concept, but every single place is different. And we know that culturally when you go to talk to folks. And so they have to help work that out. So you can't say, well, you know, you will do this program exactly this way in every county in West Virginia. I'm sorry, folks. It doesn't work that way. You've got to understand that one size doesn't fit all. And then, of course, number three, right? The big one you've heard all morning. This one right here, stigma. This still, to this day, remains a key obstacle in addressing some of these issues. And we, we, we found that. We also identified, for summary, what are the key action targets that we should think about? Obviously, you've heard about education and prevention. Wonderful job. We know the data on that. A lot of this stuff, as you all pointed out, isn't arguable anymore. More infrastructure for treatment recovery. There's no question that we've got to pay attention to putting more into that. And remember, when I say treatment and recovery, I'm not just talking about treating someone and getting them to recover. I'm talking about all the things that go around that that you've heard about. And then, number three, and this was in the report way before you asked me to come here and talk about it, Dean Coben, you've got to use a public health disease model. There's just no question about that. You've got to eliminate the stigma, and you've got to use a model that makes sense. And we know this from doing it over and over and over again. So those were kind of our three action targets. Stigma, again, a big, big deal. So as I finish up here in this last part, what, what is it that maybe I can give you some insights into that will help you think about the harm reduction issue or all of the harm reduction issues you've heard? And how would, might that be approached if you're listening and you're with the local health department or if you're a mayor or if you're a town councilman or if you're a law enforcement or if you're a physician, how can you approach this? And some of this you'll say, well, that's not rocket science either, but this is how we can accomplish things that need to happen, and this is serious to do that. Like I said, when you look at Waldos, when you're looking for Waldos, you often find other things that become very clear. So in the Waldo scheme, you see all these little events occurring and when you, when you focus in looking for Waldo, you actually find these other things. So what I'm going to give you in the next couple of minutes is this idea that we have to think, remember that everything we think we know is really about perception. And remember, I love this statement from Elizabeth Thornton. It takes you a minute to think about this, so I'm going to go a little bit slower here. 
We perceive through our senses that a person or a situation or an event, and in an instant, we immediately project our mental model, our fear, our background, and our experience into that perception. This often results, we need to understand, in cognitive errors and means we, we, make a, we, we don't get it right because we're not just looking at... And so if you think about what Holly was saying and Donnie was saying, we know that we've known this stuff. Why is it that it isn't happening more thing? It's because different people perceive it different ways. So facts are not alone. It's also these other things. So I'm going to mention some of the ways that we might approach that that we learned in the Waldo Project. So let's listen to some real quick voices. These are some quotes. I've made sure that they're carefully uh, uh, anonymized. But here's a person in recovery. Treatment and recovery communities have a heavy influence to see drug use as the problem instead of a coping strategy for a larger and deeper problem. We need to understand that. I've heard that over and over again. Peer recovery coach. I was turning people away who didn't subscribe to my abstinence-only philosophy, and later, later I found their names in the obituary of the newspaper, and I knew we had to do something different. People were saying that naloxone enables people to use more drugs, but I pushed back and I said, I can't help somebody recover if they're dead. And these are real voices. These are real people. We had some really emotional moments in these sessions, you can imagine. <clears throat> Tears were shed, people shared information, said they hadn't even shared it with their spouse. This was a good one. The open discussion among people of diverse background experience is an important and helpful step that needs to be replicated more broadly across the community. Discussion among people with diverse backgrounds and experiences. Perception, folks. Perception. That's what our job is, is to also get people talking about this, get them together. Get, I mean, he said it, she said it, we found it really important. I think we're making progress. And then on harm reduction programs, one person said, I've seen people move from intolerance to tolerance to acceptance to advocacy. And it's happening because the various groups are communicating with one another. Important. So, here's a little quote from uh, Forrest Gump, maybe. <laughs> believing is seeing, and seeing is believing. So I'm going to be, in the last two minutes I have here, three minutes, I'm going to talk about some seeing. What does it mean to see things? Pardon my little pun, but everybody knows I love acronyms. We're going to see some personal C's that can help you with this, some togetherness C's, some action C's, and some result C's. And I love C's, and I love collaboration, because that's in my, one of my words in my title, so I love the C's. Personal C's, compassion. You know the difference between compassion and empathy? Probably the psychology folks do. Compassion says that you suffer together, but you don't have compassion if you don't think that you're going to do something to alleviate that suffering. It's not compassion if it doesn't have an action to it. It's important to remember. Caring is important. A commitment to doing it. I think we have a lot of this in the personal people that are doing this, but let's move on. What do we have to do together? We have to communicate, we have to cooperate, we have to collaborate. And I love collaboration, as you know. Remember, collaboration means co-labor. The Ramsey clan's motto is ora et labora. In Latin, it means pray and work. Labora means work. So if you're going to collaborate, that means both sides are working, not just one. If you're just giving somebody information, you're cooperating, but you're not collaborating. We've got to get everybody boots on the ground working together. We've got to communicate. Here are the action ones. Common ground. We know we hear common ground a lot. It means sharing common ideas and purposes. Did you know that really, that if you look up the definition of common ground, common ground means you share certain things, but you totally disagree on other things. So we know there's disagreement, so you've got to find common ground. You've got to converge. And since we're out of time, I won't do my little demonstration I was going to do. But <laughs> convergence is where well, I'm going to because it's important. So I'll get Ali to stand up, and you to stand up, Holly. Come up here. When you talk about convergence, you know, you got converging lines and diverging lines. Sorry, MDTV guys, need to move the camera over. Come up here, Allie. So I got, I got Holly here.
and I got Allie here. I want you to look that way, and I want you to look that way. These two folks are totally 180 degrees apart, right? And they can go right down their path, and all that happens is they go further and further apart. They are divergent. How can we get those two people? And, and Holly can say, oh, well, I kind of think about that, and she turns this way, and Allie turns this way, and they start walking, and they're still divergent. They're still divergent. So stand straight and look both ways. How do you get divergence into convergence? Both parties have to use these C's. Take three or four steps backwards. Backwards. Take two or three steps backwards and say, okay, let me see if I can really try to understand this. And then you make a little turn. And you make a little turn. And then as you move back forward, guess what? You have a common point, And you have converged, okay? Think about that. Think about that analogy. You can sit down. Thank you. And you've got to connect. If you want to know about connection and the importance of connections, go to this YouTube TED Talk by a lady named Rachel Wurzman, who's a, uh, who's a neuroscientist. She talks about how connection and loss of connection probably is contributing significantly to the opioid. And she goes into the brain science. So do that one. The last is the results are change, culture, and community. We've got to think about this differently. We've got to have a culture change. We've got to be in the communities. We've got to be doing that that way. And, and so those are the key elements there. So seeing clearly the C's of these things is so important to how we approach this and move forward together. So from the Waldo, the key things, and notice all the C's. I already went through this, but it's change, collaboration, communication, cooperation, community. Stigma remains an issue. Those are the key themes. Many of you know, and many of you know this person. I'm near and dear to my heart. I've known Jan for years we, uh, when I was state director, and she came up through the system. Uh, we worked together, taught rescue with her, and, and we're friends. She did a recent real TED talk on this. That's what they've done in Huntington, which is fabulous things. You know, the Waldo Project, she was a member, I can say that. She was one of the 100 people in this, as were several other people, uh, several of the folks in the Heroin E uh, documentary. Uh, we're in the Waldo group, and we did that way before that was ever made. Uh, but really important that you look at that one as far as first responders goes, because Jan is just a, an amazing person. By the way, the, the Waldo in the Huntington area was done in collaboration, and I want to give credit to Marshall University. We did it together, and, and, and it was very, I appreciate that. It was very helpful. You talked about Vancouver and Canada. You should also look, if you're talking about harm reduction and hope I don't misstep here because I'm not an expert, but Mark Tyndale has a wonderful TED Talk on harm reduction that you should read, and he is a big person up that way, or was. And so, you know, uh, just pointing that out. So to summarize, and I'm done, uh, three important themes from this project, and I already mentioned those. You know, remember that it's complex, it takes coordination, cooperation, it's, it's got to have community-based, one size doesn't fit all, and the stigma thing is something we just have to continually work, work and work on. Listen to the voices. I listed a few of them. And always strive to see, see, use the C's, see and understand. And believing is seeing, and seeing is believing. Thank you very, very much. Thank, I want to thank you, Dr. Ramsey, and thank all of our speakers. So um, we do have some some time now for uh, dialogue, question and answers. Um, I just want to point out there are microphones on each side of the room. So if anyone would like to um, pose a question. Please use those microphones so that everyone can hear you and that folks who are listening online can also hear the question uh, that are posed. So I'm going to open it up. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Guys, on. On. you're on. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, certainly, thank you to our guests who bothered to come to Morgantown and 
uh, visit our beautiful campus. Um, uh, I think between the three panel members that address the issue of harm reduction uh, programs and the challenges that are associated with it, one area is that I did not see a lot of focus on it uh, are the challenges of proper tools and technologies that can be utilized in improving the program outcomes. And I'll give you a bit of insight. I happen to be in a, uh, a participant in a recent program that was actually sponsored through Gilead Sciences it's called FOCUS uh, through their regional meetings where states like Virginia, Washington, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, Ohio participated in presenting mm -hmm. their data on Hep C and HIV co-infections through a harm reduction program and linkage to care. I think one of the key areas that the uh, health providers and healthcare professionals highlighted were really their challenges in proper collection of the data and the use of technology that will allow them their efforts to become much more consolidated in formulating some of the policy changes that would be pertinent to the success of such programs. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get your perspectives on whether it's from the community base, as uh, Dr. Ramsey uh, very uh, effectively articulated, or law enforcement, as uh, Officer Barnell or Dr. Hagen from New York. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, around some of the tools and technologies that healthcare professionals or law enforcement have to bring in, in standardizing the collection of effective data mm -hmm. because we don't know uh, where the addicts are. We don't know the effectiveness of getting these individuals into the program. There is not a lot of data out there and publications that can highlight these type of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. Disseminating in both research information and interventions is, is, a, is a real challenge, especially in a rural area where people have transportation barriers. Um, there's a lot of work being done on, you know, the use of cell phones as a way to disseminate um, interventions to people who use drugs. And there's actually fairly high smartphone use and ownership among, among drug users throughout the country. So that is really an, sort of an open and active area of research. I know that. Um, in terms of like policy, you know, that's with our Center for Drug Use and HIV Research, we have sort of struggled to figure out how to make connections with policymakers so that our research evidence gets into their hands, that they can use it to inform policies and, and legislation. But I've also started to work more closely with the Drug Policy Alliance and um, with the American Foundation for AIDS Research because they really have the experts. So partnering, partnering with them and getting their ideas about, about how to do that dissemination and make those connections, I think that's a new avenue for us, for us to work on. Yeah. You want to add to that? Well, in law enforcement, we use, we use the data every day, of course, when we're data-driven in law enforcement. Uh, but as far as for changing policy, what we did in North Carolina was that we took the data from uh, the Drug Alliance, those mm -hmm. kind of those kind of databases, and fed them into our Health Department Injury Prevention uh, Group, which is all things statistical when it comes to medical care uh, or injury, and that's overdoses and stuff in North Carolina. And they had a great database anyway. A guy named Scott Pressurebell, uh, his statistics are used at a national level most of the time. And we used those databases in with the North Carolina Health Department. And then when we had our large stakeholder meeting, like you're saying with 60 to 150 people, or our decision-making groups, which were about 30 people, uh, you know, decision-makers, as you say, uh, we were able to give them that data mm -hmm. and say this is how we can affect that data with, with new programs or new policy. And so we got, you know, it's different. The Drug Alliance can sometimes not agree with what's going on with politicians. And I've, we've had meetings where that didn't go well, but we were just able to take the same numbers, put it into a more accepted uh, group organization, and then that group fed the same numbers to the decision makers, and it, it helped with our programs. <clears throat> we've had something called the SAFE Act and the HOPE Act, 
that has been passed in the last two years in North Carolina, and it's all data-driven. And then these are the programs we believe can help fix some of those numbers. So. Very quickly, so we have time for the others, but Ali, as I understood your question, I think that there's always room to do better at that. But I'll, I'll back up since I kind of represent today what I was talking about. The key to all that, you can have the best tools in the world, and the best technology in the world. If you don't have trust, both with who you're getting the data from, you're, it's not going to come freely. And by the same token, when you talk about policy, I mean, you know, I worked for a lot of years in policy at the gov with government in West Virginia, and, you know, believe it or not, even in our current world, people are interested in the facts, but they'll only hear you if they know you and trust you. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter what you say until they say, I believe you, or I know that you're trying to tell me the correct thing. And those are the kind of things that, regardless of what we do on the tech side, this human connectedness and redevelopment of trust, not just in West Virginia, but across the country, uh, and, and civility, if you will, and other C, is so critical to being able to use that information. Because, you know, information is information overload now, and there's so much noise, so how do people filter that? They filter that by saying, well, you know, yeah, there's 10 people there, but I know that guy, and he's never lied to me before, and I went to school with him, and I know his kids, so, or she, and if she tells me that, I can believe it. That's important. Thank you. Dr. Christensen? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all for... Is this on? Yeah, yeah move it. Okay. Thank you, and um, thank you all for your presentations and um, fruitful discussion so far. My name is Dr. Christensen. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health, and I do study um, drug use, uh, mostly among adolescents, but... Uh, we do a lot of community engagement, so it was interesting to hear uh, Dr. Ramsey's uh, enthusiasm about community engagement, which actually we believe is the only way to get anything moving in local communities, that is to get local people on board with you and actually collaborate with them on changes. The, um, in my arrogance, I tend to call it the guru approach, where you uh, bring an expert into a scenario like this and you start telling everybody what to do. Those are bound not to work very well. Mm -hmm. So um, harm reduction has been really high on the agenda in recent years. And uh, I've had the privilege of visiting uh, kin parts of Canada a number of times in, in, in over the last years. Actually, I was there on the day cannabis was legalized completely in the country. and. In that conference, people took us to a cannabis production facility, you know, basically a massive, big production place where they're just, where they're just growing the plants and telling us what to do. And we went through this really high-level PR introduction to, you know, different types of cannabis and this sort of thing. It was, it was pretty interesting. Um, but, you know, in that conference, which was given in an area where um, uh, over 60% of the population is from the indigenous part of, of, of Canada, I was greeted by two ladies that had a sort of a, a pin in their, uh, on, their, on their chest which said, I love somebody who uses drugs. And this is such a different approach to coming from the Harry Anslinger era of um, the way we have done things down here for so long. So my question to you are, are, are two. One, is it possible that in the current scenario, and with stigmatization and the criminalization of drug use, we are basically creating a social pathway for drug users to make it harder for them to quit and therefore enabling them to use more rather than to reverse their trajectory with that current scenario. So what I mean by that, when we stigmatize people and we tell them that they are immoral, bad, they can't participate in society, we take away their opportunities, isn't it possible that we are basically telling them to continue to use drugs rather than enabling them to go back? And then my other question would be, what, what are your thoughts on decriminalization, even of hard drugs? Thank you. Well, I think that, um, you know, stigma has been 
has been uh, consistently shown to be a barrier for people to access services. Um, and really, services are really the pathway to recovery and to health and well-being. Um, the enabling hypothesis has never been demonstrated to, 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 to be um, valid. I don't know that there's any, there's, I know that there's no scientific evidence to support that claim that people will, um, will, will use drugs or, or that this is going to perpetuate their drug use. Um, the decision to stop using drugs is a personal one. Uh, you know, no amount of coercion I'm, coercion really does not work to help people to stop using drugs. Um, and, you know, this, I think that we have to realize that, you know, I mean, I ha in my family, I have um, my brother, my sister, they both had, they died early because of substance use. My nephew died of an overdose two years ago. Um, you know, so this acknowledgement that, you know, uh, drug users are, are us. You know, they're they're part of my family. They're they're part of my um, genetic heritage too. I'm sure it goes back generations. So you know, that sort of that sort of approach tends to win people over rather than shut them out. And in terms of, of uh, drug legalization, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I've I've been skeptical of that myself in the past. I think that there's uh, you know, I'm curious about interventions like heroin prescription programs for people who have a hard time and for whom methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone don't work. I think we should be open-minded and we should, you know, we should, we should approach these things, you know, with a, with a, scientifically and think about them, you know, rationally and unemotionally. But I don't know that there's an answer. I know that I believe that the evidence in, in heroin prescription in Europe and Canada, so far, you know, it seems to show that these programs are effective for some some segment of the population. Other people want to respond to? Well, I guess you're looking at me for the decriminalization question. Uh, I've had that before. Uh, I will tell you, you know, after 35 years of doing it one way, it's tough to change. I, I mean, especially when you see the absolute worst end result over and over again of, of certain substances. I mean, of course, I see that with alcohol also. I mean, how many traffic fatalities I've seen and dealt with because of alcohol. I, I told someone today, if it wasn't for substances, law enforcement wouldn't have near as much to do. I mean, if there's almost a substance involved in every incident we go to, one way or the other. Uh, but to say decriminalization of, uh, I, I think you mentioned uh, the hard substances, heroin, fentanyl, that kind of thing. I mean, I just see such a devastation of what it does to people when they use it. Uh, and we're dealing with criminaliz decriminalization of marijuana now in almost every state. There's some bill running around. And I just tell people to say decriminalization and zero tolerance to me are both lazy answers. Uh, zero tolerance is a buzzword, you know, and what does that really mean? And we really want to arrest everybody for everything we've ever done wrong. And decriminalization means there's no controls. I have a problem with both of those. I know that in alcohol, you know, we, we try that with alcohol. If anybody, I'm not, even I'm not that old, but we try that with alcohol, and we see how well legalized alcohol has worked for this country, right? It, if you're medical, you know you have many more alcohol-related diseases and stuff you're dealing with every day. And the same people that sell alcohol will sell marijuana. And the sell, same people that sell tobacco will sell marijuana. And I'd like somebody to show me how you're going to keep, how you're going to stop it from turning into the same thing. We know that alcohol uh, distributors, and if you're in here, I'm sorry, I mean, I have drank alcohol myself, by the way. Uh, it, alcohol distributors and tobacco distributors target the youngest population possible. They've done it since they started selling it because they know if you're a chronic user, the, the younger you start, the more likely you become a chronic user and you will buy more of their products. In Denver, the three most popular products are gummy bears, lollipops, and something called a pot tart, which looks like the pop tarts with creative purple writing and stuff on it. I don't think that's designed for me to smoke or to eat. So I, I'd like to see what the regulations would be. If you tell me that marijuana is legal tomorrow, we stop arresting people for it. And, and, I, and I also am the first one to say, 
arresting every 16-year-old kid for marijuana is just, just counterproductive. And we are trying to find ways not to do that in most states. I mean, I know in North Carolina and, and the surrounding states, there's every kind of diversion program known for young people. But I think it should also be for the 22-year-old guy that's never been in trouble, but he got caught with a little bit of marijuana. We've got to figure out a way not to give those people a drug criminal record, and now they can never get a job. Right? So I, I, I believe there's some middle ground. I don't know what that is. I, I mean, I think a lot of smart people have to get in a room and try to figure that out. But just to say decriminalization of of substances so there's no crime involved with it, I, I don't know if that's a good answer. You know, the other thing we haven't talked about today is the underlying causes of, of substance use and the fact that, you know, some 60% of people who use who have, you know, opioid use disorders have had um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma. Um, and we're not doing, we really don't do anything significant to to address that problem. So yeah, people, yeah. there's there's motivations for people to use drugs and we need to talk to talk to people about their motivations and not assume that it's, you know, uh, criminal ten, criminal tendencies or just, you know, um, sensation seeking. You know, opioids are really good for treating pain and they're very good for treating including emotional pain. Um, so that's that's another that's another obstacle. We if we want to, you know, want to try to get get to at-risk youth, that's a real challenge, you know, instead of passively waiting for them to come to, to, you know, pediatricians' offices or emergency departments, we have to think about how to actively go out and find at-risk youth and also do something, you know, do something that's going to be effective. I'm yeah. sorry, Bill, we're going to add to this. But I, I was just going to, that you, you went where I was going to go, so mm -hmm. I won't belabor that point, but to, to, to take your two questions, the stigma issue, um, is, is as, as you said, I think we have to look much beyond the, the grassroots or the, the 50,000 view and take it up to 250,000, 250,000, meaning there are, a, there are the adverse childhood experiences. I was going to mention those. But also society as a whole now, the unconnectedness. You know, we like to think we're connected because we have Facebook and Twitter and we text all the time. It's been sh starting to be shown even more and more that the kind of connectedness that occurs in a one-on-one -on -one interaction definitely has effects in the brain. And if you look at that one TED talk that I gave you that Rachel did, you'll, it'll, it'll really help you look at that. And so I, w I believe that the stigma issue is much, much broader. And the, and the way society in general, it's not just about the drugs, society in general is contributing to this, in, and we need to really think about that. The second thing you ask about decriminalization, I struggle with that. I try to apply the C's. Uh, when I taught residents a lot in emergency medicine, and I guess that's the physician in me, says uh, be very careful about that kind of change that you make because I also, as a policy person, we forget unintended consequences. And so on a personal level, we're, we are already at this stage. So before I make a significant shift, I want to understand are there serious unintended consequences. Granted, there is data, and I understand that, but for me to make that shift personally, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I used to say, people say, don't just stand there, do something. I used to tell my residents, don't just do something, stand there. Sometimes overaction, when you don't know the unintended consequences, particularly in policy, in, in policy, is catastrophic. And I just think we need to be careful that we don't make something worse. That's my opinion. And I appreciate the question because that is the question that most people avoid now at the policy level is the decriminalization question, especially with marijuana. That's the question now. And, you know, you see all these, all these studies, not even studies, you see all these opinions on television and Facebook and all that stuff, and it's really, it is a super complex question to me. I don't know. It'd be, I'd love to sit into some studies and see. Yeah, I'm particularly interested in the whole issue of how we get these uh, strategies implemented out to the small rural communities. And I'll be interested in the panelists' opinion on that. Many of the interventions are all done in Vancouver, big cities, how we do this. And to us in West Virginia here, the real challenge is how do we get this out? And, and even what's the role of the local health department? And I'll be interested in Danny and her experience in North Carolina and also here and the rest of the places. How, just how are we actually going to get it down there? It's much easier to do things in the big city. 
Well, with, with us, it's, you know, we talked about it last night at dinner a little bit, I think, is finding your champion. You know, finding somebody that's passionate about it. Uh, I don't think there's any, I think there's a lot of truth to, you know, 15% of the people do 80% of the work most of the time, and it's who's passionate. Uh, and, once, and, you know, there's always someone that's very passionate about the, the topic we're talking about today. So wherever we had a program, uh, the people that had lived the life, whatever you want to say, or had lost someone, they obviously, they, they gravitate to the, to the harm reduction world eventually. And then they're the ones that would go back into the really small communities because it is hard to put in a multifaceted program into a community of a thousand. You know, it just, you don't have the infrastructure, but you could put pieces of your program. I think you said it, no program's the same. So what you have in Vancouver, who cost all the elected officials their job, by the way, the safe, the safe injection site bill that they got passed, they all got unelected the next time. So they knew they were committing political suicide, and they still did it, which I think speaks volumes for what they were trying to accomplish, by the way. Uh, you can go into those communities and do parts of these programs. So we found the champions like the mother from a little town like Kenley, North Carolina, and maybe she wanted to help people with syringes. Uh, and so we could get the syringes in, and she would make the contacts to get people to larger programs in a, uh, a more metropolitan area. Like, you know, 50 miles away as a city, I'll get you the free transportation to the daily meeting or your daily dose of uh, buprenorphine or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the state scale, we did it just like you. I mean, it sounds so silly, but we had lunch with the policymakers one at a time. And we would sit down and, and talk about the programs. And then we would ask them for their quotes. And we would use their quotes in a quote sheet. And that you can't believe the power that carries when you've got 30 sheriffs saying they're OK with something. And you take it to other, other locations. And then that sheriff now knows he's OK with his peers. Now, I'm a law enforcement guy. So I know who makes the decisions on certain things in certain places. But now the sheriff goes over to the county commissioner's office and says, hey, I think this might work. I, I'm good with it. And then the county commissioners go, yeah, okay. Well, let's take it into the smallest part of this county, and the health department will be there every Tuesday. And I don't know who that reaches, but it reaches somebody on Tuesday, every Tuesday, and then it grew from there. So we, we found our champions. We helped them with resources from the Harm Reduction Coalition with resources. They almost all did it for free. Mm -hmm. But then those programs start in little places, and you see them starting to blossom into bigger and bigger things. And I've kind of the ink spot thing, I guess. And that's how it worked for us. I, you know, we, and we have no funding for anything, basically. I, I need some New York money. I need. I, need some of that. I need some of that New York money. But it's the resources, the medical community like yourselves, you provide the resources if we just know where to go to find them. And then that goes back to collaboration. You heard Dr. Ramsey say, we've got to sit in the same room so Dr. Ramsey can go, oh, I can get you all the syringes you need, right? For a, what, four cents a piece, something like that? Yeah. Instead of $500,000 for a lifetime of medical treatment, one unused syringe. So that's how it worked for us. We moved out like that. I don't know if that would work here or not. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an urban health person, um, <coughs> and you all are the experts in urban and rural health. Uh, you know, there's, there, the, the, you have completely different challenges, and you know, it's, it's, a comp it's a really good question, but it's a really long, I think it takes a really long answer. And, you know, there's, there's been a lot of really good models in the use of, you know, peers, peer-delivered services, peer-delivered interventions, thinking about how to harness the, um, harness the structure of a social network to get services out to people who are, you know, really uh, detached and hidden. But, um, you know, I think we know from all the research on harm reduction, we know sort of what works. We kind of have boiled it down to the necessary elements, and then it's up to communities with academic partners and other experts to sort of figure out, you know, all those very important details. And the trust issue, trust is earned. And yeah. I was just going to comment that trust is, and that takes some time to build. So we, we are, you know, it's a crisis. We want to get it quickly. But you, you find in, particularly in rural areas and culturally, 
there, there has to be trust developed. It's kind of like the old deal, you have lunch together, have a hot dog, and you might not talk about that the first time. And that takes a little bit of time, but you get those champions and you get something started and then it moves. That's, that's really all that I know and all that I've found. We have a lot of success with the faith-based community, but you know, I know that in a lot of worlds that that's almost us, you know, that's almost pariahs. You know, we don't want any faith-based involved, you know, because they have their own opinion. But they were really good in small communities about being a, a focal point and having people that knew everybody. And if you don't think there's users at church, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they know who they are, they know who each other is. It it worked. It worked in several, our out, as a matter of fact, our out west areas, mm -hmm. the faith-based communities grabbed hold of it, you know, hook, line, and sinker and try to help people. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, in New York City, uh, to quote Freddie Mercury, it's been no better roses, no pleasure cruise. <laughs> and, you know, we're still now, right now, in, in the Bronx, South Bronx, the rates of overdose, if South Bronx were a state, we'd be number two after West Virginia. So it's, a, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, we don't have it all figured out, and we, it's, it's a moving target. We're going to constantly be trying to react and respond to, to changes in, in, in drug use epidemiology. All right, so each of you has mentioned stigma um, sort of in your presentation, and I understand that, you know, reducing stigma as a way to get people to treatment is great. Um, I'm sure there's lots of evidence for that. My concern is well, how does that affect the future drug use of children of patients that are, you know, with substance use disorders? Because the approach that we are taking by advocating, advocating for a destigmatization is so completely different than the approaches that we are using when we're tackling other unhealthy behaviors, whether it be smoking, drunk driving, um, mm -hmm. unhealthy eating. Are we, do we have any data yet? Or are we just sort of shooting blind and saying, okay, all of a sudden, we're not going to see an uptick in um, I mean, in substance use of children who have parents that now might feel that they're using more in the open because it's now more destigmatized. Mm -hmm. Do we have any data at all or are we just saying? You know? Well, we have plenty of data and experience showing that stigmatization and criminalization uh, won't solve the problem. It just drives it underground. It just drives people away from services and, um, and services work. Um, there, I mean, the, the, like again, the the reason for for people, the motivation for using drugs are isn't because um, just because they're available. I mean, when I was growing up, there was there were drugs available that I never touched. Um, it's it's very complex. So, um, you know, I don't think that I, I I would be very surprised. Everybody, most people in this room would be very surprised if um, you know, destigmatization had that unintended consequence. Um, the problem, though, with stigma reduction is that, you know, there's been a lot of research, a lot of research in Africa around uh, uh, HIV and stigma, and, and in the United States around HIV and stigma that's really advanced our thinking, but you know, we need to figure out how to, how to do this on a, on a bigger scale, because this is a problem which is affecting just broad swaths of the country, and we can't we can't go you know agency by agency, and deliver like a succession you know three week intervention. Well, that'll take us years, and it'll be too late. So we have to think about how 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 we might implement how we might really um, help health healthcare pr practitioners and drug users themselves. How the drug use there's a lot of self stigmatization that and shame that keeps people from accessing programs. So we have to think about how to that's, that's our next challenge, I think. It's a big one. I, I've, uh, and again, there's folks still listening uh, online, so I'll be careful about this, but I, I guess the way I would answer your question about stigma personally, and in, in my opinion about that, is I think we need to be very careful, and maybe you and I are not on the same sea with what the word stigma actually means. Okay? And for me, and what we heard in Waldo and what we see every day is stigma to me gets into the compassion and the kindness and the civic duty and how we treat the person as a person. Mm -hmm. We can do that and still 
that doesn't mean we're condoning the activity. And I realize that's a fine line, but you know, we talk about that often, and if we really believe that we are a kind, caring, compassionate society, we can still love the person and still believe that the act is bad, it's bad for them, it's bad for society. So there's a difference there. And I think understanding that distinction is very important. That's, that's a personal answer for me, because there are many issues that one could say, oh, that's stigmatized. And again, I'm, I'll be careful here. I'll probably get a bunch of emails about this. But I think in some ways, that's that same thing I'm talking about with society. We really like to jump to that word when we don't really know what we mean, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, there's a difference between loving a person and knowing that person and feeling kind to that person and understanding that they have a disease, that this is a disease, okay? And, but still not condoning the fact that, oh, it's perfectly okay to keep doing that and teach your kids to keep doing that and it's all okay. I don't, agree, I don't personally agree with that. And that's a fine line and it's not a good thing and I'm perfectly willing to have people disagree with me on that, but that's my perception of, what you, of your question. We're at a simple question. Are there harm reduction people here? Like harm reduction coalition? Is anybody from harm reduction coalition actually in here? I'm not trying to set you up for, <laughs> like, I'm not raising my hand. Sure. Uh, We're here earlier, but I think it's left. I, I would tell you this, I know this is a very critical time too about what we're talking about. Because at the, like the Harm Reduction Coalition National Conference in New Orleans, the, the topic was where harm reduction is going with uh, organized entities, right? Like how involved are they going to be with law enforcement? How involved are they going to be with health care facilities and health departments? Are, you know, are they losing their identity? Because uh, true harm reduction coalitions, you know, just like Dr. Rands was saying, whatever you're doing is okay, and we're just trying to make it it's safer, right? Yeah. It's just like airbags and seat belts. You're going to drive. We're not trying to stop you from driving. You're going to drive too fast. We're just trying to keep you alive if you have a wreck. You know, and, and then wherever you're at, that's where they meet you, right? Whatever you're doing in your life is okay. They're going to try to make it as safe and as non-harmful as possible. And a lot of Government entities don't think that way. You know, we want you to get, quote, better. We want you to come to a better place or where, where we think better is. And so we're at a really critical phase in the harm reduction world. When we say harm reduction, it's not always what, other, what the harm reduction people think harm reduction is. And they're really deciding as a national organization how involved and who they're going to be involved with. Uh, like, do they really, you know, law enforcement, Law enforcement usually does bad things to people that are substance users. You know, how involved do they want law enforcement in their programs? And, and are health departments trying to take over the syringe exchange world and put regulations and, mm -hmm. and rules and steps in it that you have to do to get clean, unused syringes? And that's a real issue in the harm reduction world. Just so you know, when you start having these collaborations and what you think is right, it, there is nothing said that is more true than you have to have the community you're trying to help involved from the very beginning if you're going to make a plan or a program. Mm -hmm. So the, just think about that. When you say harm reduction, that is a real thing now. I mean, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll make our last question be one that was submitted online. Uh, Kimberly? Okay, so I'll um, kind of paraphrase a few questions that are very similar um, that a few, a few different folks have have submitted. I think what some folks are wondering is how do you how do you bring those disparate perspectives to the table? How do you get the folks who maybe don't believe or don't support harm reduction programs? How do you get them to the table in the first place to have that collaborative conversation and to um, move forward? Oh, we did it very simply. We went one on one with whoever we thought was the decision makers. Uh, and especially the ones that were going to be tough, we found the right messenger to go give the message. Uh, and then, 
and, and then it was the it was the big meetings, like he's saying, you invited people and you fed them. That seems I don't know if there's a class on that, y'all. But I mean, <laughs> if you in North Carolina, it's called barbecue. If you'll put barbecue on the plate, you know somebody's <laughs> going to show up. I mean, they're going to come at least long enough to get the barbecue. And I'm telling you, with us, I don't want to oversimplify it, but that was the start. Now we had to have real good programs and smart people involved and the correct answers and things that made sense. But to get people to listen, uh, we gave them free naloxone <laughs> and talked to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then we had larger stakeholder meetings uh, with food. And we sat around and, and gave our PR. Uh, and we also, uh, I've told other people, we kind of had a PR media blitz that we constantly are putting stories about harm reduction into mm -hmm. different newspapers. Because they're always looking for filler. You know, and if you'll come to them with a good story, they'll they'll put it in the paper. And so we just we just kept building the brand till it it worked for us. <clears throat> I want to say I think it's also you have to think about it in terms of a longer term relationship, not just sort of you know like a disappearing task force that comes together, you know, three or four times. But you know, in New York City, we found that have continuing maintaining relationships between the health department, syringe exchange programs, and law enforcement has been, has been really important. I, I was just going to say, uh, the, when, you, when you think about getting people to come, remember the C's that I talked about. And those start first personally. So you have to be in the right place to be able to, 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 to start to do this. So then you have to be together with some folks, and then there's some actions. So really what we're talking about is getting people to the table to talk about this in the communities is, is a change. You're, obviously, if you're saying they're not coming, then there's some reason that they're not coming. And the, the best analogy I like about that is, as a wise sage, a mentor of mine used to say, and you've, you've read about it, is when you're looking to do that, you can't force people to come to the dance. But if you're, if you're having something occurring, leave the door open, many times and if you invite them, they won't come. But if they hear the music and they walk by the door and they look in there and they say, wow, I think I'd like to give this, the door is always open. And so, you know, it really is almost one at a time or a group at a time. And they have to want to talk about that and be there. So you can't force that. And I, I like that philosophy and I've used that and I think it does work. So, you know, it's an invitation. It's not a mandate. And I think that's really important. Well, I want to thank all of our speakers. Please join me in thanking them today and thank all of you for attending. And good day. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure, sir. It's always fun hanging around. <laughs> You're a good guy. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>